the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road side-by-sides. Featuring the value-minded new Ranger 800 midsize, Hunt Far More Trail. Polaris has the Ranger side-by-side -side you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Steve Morse, fruit grower, distiller, entrepreneur. Another personal story on FarmFamilyPeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Large animal veterinarians are becoming fewer and fewer. We'll find out why when animal science major at Kansas State University, Chase Miller, joins us on Ag Insights. Then we'll talk about ornamental grasses when we join Mark Viette in the garden. Plus, we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. It's the bill we've been talking a lot about here for the last couple of months. House Bill 1430, or the Bonetta Bill, was rejected on the Senate floor. The bill passed the House Committee, but a vote 11 to 4 against it in one Senate committee was enough to end its chances of passage in this year's legislative session. Supporters say the bill, which would clarify that the Virginia Right to Farm Act include commerce, will be reintroduced next year and maybe hold stronger provisions for small farmers. Nearly 250 regional, state, and national farm, ranch, and agribusiness organizations recently sent a heartfelt thank you to Chrysler Group Chair and CEO Sergio, Sergio Marchione and his Ram Trucks team for its outstanding Super Bowl commercial, So God Made a Farmer. The ad kicks off a campaign declaring 2013 the year of the farmer and features gorgeous still images with legendary radio broadcaster Paul Harvey's recitation of the virtues of the American farmer. Now Harvey originally delivered this essay at a Future Farmers of America conference in 1978. Not only did the ad strike recognition and gratefulness for what American farmers do, it also kicked off a partnership with the National FFA Foundation to draw viewers to the Keep Plowing site that's on your screen. Now for every view, download, or share of the two-minute spot, Ram Trucks will make a donation to the FFA Foundation's Feeding the World Starting at Home Hunger Program. In addition to the advertisement being the third most popular Super Bowl commercial, it has already received over 6 million online views. Now you can also view the ad on our Virginia Farming Facebook page. Well, a USDA researcher is working to develop year-round domestic strawberries. The USDA's Bob Ellison has more. Domestic strawberries are considered a summertime fruit, but U.S. Department of Agriculture researcher Kim Lewers would like to have them around all year. Lewers is an agricultural research service geneticist in Beltsville, Maryland, where she has designed a way to grow strawberries in low tunnels, basically little greenhouses. She's been able to add two more strawberry growing seasons in her test plot. We've got the April season, we've got the regular May-June season, and then we've got a July season. So we've tripled or more the times of the year that people in Maryland can eat locally grown strawberries. Lure's research is focused on East Coast growing conditions and weather. She says the low tunnels basically keep the plants cool and dry in the summer and warm in the winter, and that leads to good, healthy fruit. Not only are we getting lots of beautiful fruit, but they're staying disease-free longer after they're harvested. Lures developed the production system to help her breeding program. Without the new production system, she says she would not be able to breed locally adapted varieties that fruit for months instead of weeks in Maryland. But local growers can use the system now using California bred varieties that normally could not survive the heat of a Maryland summer. 
year-round production would be great news for growers of this lucrative crop. They are perhaps the most valuable crop per acre that you can grow. Their value per acre is around $39,000. Luer says she is aiming for year-round locally grown strawberries up and down the East Coast. Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, up the Mid-Atlantic, up into the Northeast, and that really will ensure that we have a year-long strawberry crop. That's my hope. <laughs> for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Thank you, Bob. If you can grow it or sell it, you can track it on your mobile phone. That's the word from C.J. Isbell, a third-generation farmer and co-owner of Keenbell Farm in western Hanover County. After resisting anything but a simple cell phone for years, he's now an enthusiastic user of mobile farming applications on his iPhone. He says he can measure field sizes using an app, so if he needs to change what he's planting or where he's grazing, he can see how much acreage he's dealing with. Isbell said he can check price reports for cattle and commodities, locate the closest elevators for buying grain, and see livestock auctions. He even uses apps to locate equipment and bid on it in an auction setting. Now, Isbell's family farm used to be a large grain operation. It's now a beef, pork, and poultry farm. He wants to expand his crop production to provide feed for the livestock, and mobile apps have helped. He said a lot of farmers are starting to see the benefits of using apps for marketing grain, ease of record keeping, and veterinary care records. Phone apps are helping farmers be more efficient, more data driven, and more real time. Some equipment companies are even developing mobile technology that allows an engine to broadcast its problems so that operators can be more proactive in preventing expensive breakdowns. Well, lean protein meats like chicken and turkey has increased in popularity over the past decade. The industry has seen growth nationwide thanks to a start right here in the Shenandoah Valley. George Lilly has more. The U.S. Poultry and Egg Association recently found the annual economic impact of the nation's poultry industry to be more than $8 billion. And Virginia's share of that is huge, more than $1 billion. Mike Weaver with the Poultry Growers Association of the Virginias says modern production practices have come a long way since the industry's early roots in the Shenandoah Valley. Some of the pioneers of the poultry business are come started in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, Charlie Wampler and Trig Strickler, some of the people that ran Wampers and Rocco uh, years ago, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, they started getting growers in the valley and over here in West Virginia to uh, uh, grow chickens for them in little wooden chicken houses. Virginia's poultry industry provides 13,000 direct jobs and provides 42,000 jobs indirectly related to the industry. Dr. Barry Falk with James Madison University in Harrisonburg says the booming poultry industry affects more areas of the Commonwealth's economy than you might think. And so you get what's called a multiplier effect in which everybody's spending is um, an end income benefits from the additional income for people in that particular group. Uh, they will, because of their higher incomes, they'll be providing more tax revenue to local and state governments they will rely less on the need for the social services the government supplies to people who, who are, are struggling, and that puts less pressure on local and state government spending. Virginia is currently ranked fourth in turkey production in the U.S., and we're the ninth largest chicken producing state. Virginia egg producers also sell almost $69 million worth of eggs, while poultry production is heaviest in the Shenandoah Valley. You can find poultry farms almost everywhere in the Old Dominion. The Eastern Shore is the second largest poultry producing region, followed by Southside Virginia. And poultry exports to other countries continue to be one of the bright spots in Virginia agriculture. Mexico, China, and Canada are the top three buyers of U.S. turkey meat. However, most of those dollars are not making it back to the growers. Weaver says there are about 1,200 growers in the Shenandoah Valley alone and more than 500 in West Virginia, and they're all facing some major challenges. Well, the most challenging part is right now is, is uh, making ends meet with what the companies pay us. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a, a significant increase for poultry growers for many years, at least 10. Uh, and our costs have gone up just like everybody else's. You know, 10 years ago, our propane that we heat these houses with was 60, 70 cents. 
Now it's over $2 sometimes. Despite the never-ending challenge of making a profit in a world market, the reports show that Virginia poultry growers are leaders in this vibrant economic sector. In Harrisonburg, Virginia, I'm George Lilly. Thank you, George. A lot of veterinary students are headed into small animal care, resulting in a shortage of large animal vets. We'll talk to a young man who is looking at the large animal side of veterinary medicine straight ahead on Ag Insights. Large animal veterinarians represent one of the most sought after sectors in veterinary medicine, as we've seen the number of vets that treat large animals decrease dramatically. Today, I'm joined by Chase Miller, who's studying animal science at Kansas State University. Chase, welcome to Virginia Farming. Thanks for having me. Um, give us a little bit of background about yourself. You grew up in Rockingham County? I sure did. Um, I'm a 19 year old. I was raised on a beef and poultry farm about five miles west of Harrisonburg. Um, still, still live and work there today, and uh, I was involved with 4-H and FFA in the past, and basically any agricultural organization I could get a part of. So, what made you choose Kansas State over any other school in the nation? Well, I kind of uh, lucked out. I randomly, uh, it, it kind of hit me as I was really getting involved in the Angus industry the past two or three years. Every every article written on any, anything Angus was written by some Kansas State professor or whatnot, and I thought, you know, I might as well apply, and it was an easy application. And I got in and then was later informed that I was accept, accepted into their early admittance program for their vet school, which is something I really wanted, and um, that was kind of icing on the cake. Well, then what made you decide to go the large animal route for veterinary medicine? It's been kind of a culmination of all my life events that have kind of led me to that, to that point and um, definitely being involved heavily with our Angus and beef on our farm. Um, my whole life giving shots and helping, helping pull calves and, and all that and having a horse and sheep and pigs and anything you could imagine. Um, the food animal vet was definitely the, the path for me and the past couple years it's, it's become pretty evident. Okay. Um, you mentioned food animal vet. Share with me some statistics um, that you have seen among your peers in college, the numbers who are going with the larger food animal vets as opposed to small uh, pet veterinary medicine. Well, I did a little research um, last night and I found that in the United States there are about 1,155 food animal only vets and uh, compare that with 43,000 small animal only vets. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty big difference in the number of people that are willing to get out there and work with large animals. It, it's a, a little bit better um, at Kansas State. It's more of a agricultural oriented program that they run. And within my early admit program, um, out of 24 students, I was one of six that have an interest in large animal vet work. So it's about 25%. I was the only male out of that group also that was interested in large animal. Why do you think that number is so lopsided? There are, there are many reasons. Um, for one, if you, if you work in small animal, you don't have as many on-call nights, um, going out to a dairy at two in the morning. Um, also, you don't have the chance of really getting kicked by a big cow or some, some of those physical things that take a toll on your body. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit nicer, I guess, for some people to be in an office working, having the animals come to you instead of having to go up to two hours away to work on an animal. Right. That's a lot to think about. But when you think about those numbers, you think about the dogs and cats that people take to their vet. Mm -hmm. But then you think about, especially on larger farms, the herds mm -hmm. of large cattle, of horses, sheep, pigs, it just seems like there's going to be quite a need for large animal vets. There is, there's an extensive need for large animal vets and um, I believe that the United States is actually in a vet deprived state with the food animal industry and they're, they're taking any people they can get out of vet school and trying to put them somehow into large animal and they're just not getting the numbers to turn out like they'd, like they'd hoped for. Well I think part of it is kind of like you said, you know you grew up on a farm you're used to going out to that barn at two o'clock to deliver a calf. Um, 
you're used to being around them and you know the hard work that's involved. And I think a lot of the kids who might be coming in to do the animal science have never had that experience. And it, it might be overwhelming to think, this is what my life's gonna be. I've got, <laughs> yeah. I've got to be on call. It's definitely um, shocking for most kids, especially in my first year of undergrad. Um, all my animal science courses have been geared towards, they call it the big three, beef, swine, and, um, and uh, sheep. And so, you know, for those kids that come out of the city and they've never been exposed to this, it's, it's a big shock to them and kind of getting that hands-on effect with a, an animal that could essentially kill you if, if they affected you wrong. Um, it, it shocks those kids and kind of makes them think twice, I guess. Right. Um, you have completed your first year in your undergrad. What's been your biggest challenge this year? Definitely time management. In, in college, I've come to know that there are so many things you can get involved with. And I mean, I wanted to be a part of every club possible and all sorts of cattle clubs and vet clubs and whatnot. And you just kind of run out of hours in the day. And definitely the, the, the time management part of that prioritizing has been the biggest challenge for me and something I'm still working on. Yeah, that's hard. Um, but you did, you did, did you keep some of the clubs? Did you end up having to drop a few things because of your hours and? I kind of overstocked <laughs> on, on clubs and whatnot um, my first semester. Didn't take enough classes. And so my second semester I took more classes and had to back off a few clubs. But um, kind of found my niche and really got involved how I should have been and um, really enjoyed it. Well, what has been your biggest reward? That, the time management has been a big challenge, I know. What's been your biggest reward so far? I, I took a job with the swine department at K-State and um, I'm technically a, an undergraduate research assistant and I help grad students and PhD students with research trials, but basically nutrition trials for the swine department. And um, getting to know those students has definitely been a joy. Um, not only are they really bright, but they're also fun to laugh with and fun to hang out with. And um, they've really taught me a lot about an industry that I had no prior knowledge of, or very little. That's amazing that there's so much knowledge there for you to take advantage mm -hmm. of. That's great. So what do you want to do when you graduate? What, what's your first step when you finish school? Well, my first step um, after another three years is, is to go to, to vet school. And um, in vet school, it sounds really stupid, but I'd like to get a master's in reproductive physiology and endocrinology, basically um, focused on the beef side of that. And um, after vet school, there are so many options that I'm weighing right now that, and it's so far down the line that I really can't say but I could go into practice. Um, my dream is to one day get into embryo transfer in beef cattle and um, also thinking of some overseas stuff that I could do as well, but it's, it's a long way down the road. So Those are some we'll lofty see. goals there, Chase. That's awesome. That's they great. Are. So we're about out of time, but I just wanted to ask you one more thing. Um, do you have any advice for any um, young adults who are looking to go into animal science and specifically large animal medicine? I would say get involved early. Um, find what you love and pursue it because grades do get you an interview. Um, everyone focuses on grades, especially the pre-vetters get this, uh, this stereotype of being in the books all the time and not doing anything else. But I've kind of taken a different route. Um, grades are important to me, and but I also like to get involved and that's where you start networking and meeting meeting good people and um, like I was trying to say earlier, um, the grades will get you the interview, but usually that experience behind it will get you the job or the admittance into vet school and um, stuff like that. So get involved, find something you love, and pursue it as hard as you can. Good advice, Chase. Thank you so much for being with us Thanks today. A lot. Appreciate it. Me. We'll be right back. Tall ornamental grasses can add beauty and privacy, and they can add a unique touch to flower arrangements. Let's join Mark Viette in the garden. When I went backpacking up in the Andes and in, in the open grasslands of Argentina, there was a plant that I could see for as far as I could look, 
And it was this plant here, and it was known as the pampas grass. And this is a real durable, hardy plant for your garden. Now remember, there's a couple different types. There's a hardy form for the more mountainous or colder regions. And then there is another form which will grow along the coast in some of the warmer areas. Ornamental grasses come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Anything for the sun, bright shade, maybe even shade. And it can even take standing water for periods of time. And behind me, you can look at the beautiful Miscanthus gracilimus, the maiden grass. It's a fantastic plant with nice and light and airy plumes. And just look at the variety as you're coming through. Look at this one here where the plumes are up above, blooms a little later. And then here we have the variegated ornamental grass, which has the green and the white variegation and the nice light and airy blooms. And let's go look at a couple other varieties you can use in your garden. Choose the right plant for your right location, depending on where you live. Some varieties of ornamental grasses may spread by underground rhizomes, and some can also spread from seed. So you want to be sure that you pick a variety that is nice and compact and stays in bounds, as opposed to the one that you see here that slowly spreads. So many of us have a beautiful home and just lawn in front of the house. And when we're working out in the garden in the summertime or the fall or the spring, we have no privacy. Not only that, you know, this car is going back and forth on this road, you know, every few seconds. What you can do is plant one of these large ornamental grasses like this, the zebra grass. This is like one plant. Now, granted, it's been here for 15 years or longer, but it really gives you privacy from a, a viewing standpoint and it also allows for sound abatement, so you really don't hear those cars. You're in your garden, and you don't realize you're 20 feet from the road. It's important to pick your ornamental grasses if you're going to use them in dried arrangements or regular flower arrangements before they shed. So just take them and shake them, and if you don't see all the little uh, seed pods fall off, that's a great time to go ahead and just cut them. And you know, always wear gloves or long sleeve shirts again so you don't get cut, but you just come in here and just cut a nice bunch or handful, just like this. Ornamental grasses are so easy to use. Look how we have used them in the background and really made sort of a, a wreath out of grasses. And what you might want to do is you could even come in and spray paint them, for example, I want to spray paint this one gold and it has a beautiful gold sheen that you can use in your arrangements. Or you can just go ahead and take a, a sort of a flat uh, finish or a protective finish and what it does is it prevents the seeds from shedding. On the other hand, you can just come right in here and pick some that are almost fully open and try the same thing. Just come in here with the gold, and it really gives it a little bit more brightness, and plus it also prevents them from falling apart. Or you can go ahead and use the finish that will come right in here and sort of give you that glistening look. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at our Ag Calendar, the 15th Mid-Atlantic Junior Angus Classic will be held March 8th through 10th at the Rockingham County Fairgrounds. Now for more information, please visit angus.org. The Highland Maple Festival will be held March 9th through 10th and March 16th through 17th in Monterey. Celebrate the tradition of maple syrup making and tour sugar camps. There will be pancake breakfast, maple donuts, locally harvested trout dinners, antiques, arts and crafts, bluegrass music, and clogging demonstrations. For more information, visit highlandcounty.org. Well, that does it for our show. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding full-size workhorses, including the all-new 60 horsepower Ranger XP900, hunt, farm, or trail. Polaris has the full-size Ranger you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Nancy Asher, stable owner, visionary, agent of change. Another personal story on FarmFamilyPeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know.